Thank you guys all for uh, coming out to this week's NREM seminar. It's my honor to introduce our speaker, Dr. Neil Hamilton. Neil graduated from our very <laughs> I'm not a doctor. They only call me that up here. Right? But anyway, <laughs> it's okay. Sorry. <laughs> Neil graduated from our very own forestry <laughs> program with honors. He then obtained his um, Juris Doctor degree from... Though I am a doctor, I guess. Yeah. I forgot, right? <laughs> um, Neil previously worked as an assistant attorney general for the Iowa Department of Justice. <laughs> and he's a professor for the University of Arkansas. Uh, yeah. um, he is now a professor at Drake University and a director of their Agricultural Law Center. How long have I been there? That, I don't know. Uh, okay. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Too long, some yeah. would say, right? Okay. Since 1983. Yeah. Do the math. Do the math. <laughs> <laughs> um, Great. Neil's presentation, presentation today is titled 16 Things to Know About the Des Moines Waterworks Proposed Drainage District Lawsuit. Uh, and please. whatever else people want to talk about, all right? Please join me in welcoming Neil. Well, thank, thank you, thank you. You can all hear me, hear me in the back. Okay, great. I want to thank uh, Tyler and all of his colleagues for the invitation, the opportunity to be here. Uh, it's been a wonderful day. I met with so many graduate students and talked to them about their research, and it was so, hey, it was just powerful to hear about uh, what they're interested in and how they're attracted to Iowa. So many of them have come from other states. And it made me proud uh, to be an Iowa Stater. And as we mentioned, I have a, a little bit of history with this place in terms of uh, having uh, a forestry degree here about uh, 40 years ago plus. In fact, forestry used to be here on this floor, on the second floor in uh, Bessie. Was anybody here in the 1970s? Anybody, a few folks? Uh, anybody remember me? Did I do anything crazy? You remember me, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have asked, right? But uh, so uh, watch this guy. Uh, but uh, it's a real treat to be back. And, uh, and my degree in forestry and the things that we studied here uh, and have served me uh, very well. Uh, and hopefully I've been able to serve other people. But certainly uh, what I learned here and studied how we approach natural resources, how we approach the Leopoldian uh, land ethic. Uh, have very much infused my work in agricultural law and uh, related subjects. And so I'll never uh, uh, be uh, uh, regretful that I came here and, and studied here. And uh, I'm proud to be part of it and have been involved with Leopold, or with Iowa State over the years, spent 20 plus years on the Leopold Center uh, board, continue to do uh, research funded in part uh, through the Leopold Center. And so my goal today is to talk a little bit about this Des Moines Waterworks lawsuit. Some of you have heard of it, apparently. A uh, little bit of interest in it. I'm also going to talk about a conference that we have coming up, uh, the uh, Sustaining Our Iowa Land, uh, the Past, Present, and Future of Iowa Soil Conservation Policy. And uh, uh, maybe not all of you are registered yet, but I'm going to ask Tyler to uh, hand around a little one-page uh, promo about it. It's coming up in a couple weeks. and. Uh, uh, well, that was a simple way to hand them out. I would have walked down the middle, but that's okay. Uh, you know, lawyers are very directive on stuff. And uh, as part of that conference, uh, we're doing a number of things looking at really uh, kind of where we are as a state as relates to soil and water conservation. And uh, I hope we have a chance to visit about it some more. And I've got a, a 20 question, 20 provocative questions about soil and water conservation policy that we developed that we're going to use in connection with the conference. And uh, uh, hopefully we'll have uh, some time to talk about those. And then, of course, I want to spend some time answering your questions. But first, I want to at least go through uh, quickly uh, some things about the Des Moines Water Works lawsuit, because I know that there's a fair amount of interest about it. Uh, I'll run through a few slides. Uh, you know, Henry Wallace, of course, uh, uh, spoke in the 1930s in the yearbook to uh, Soils and Men, the 38 Yearbook of Agriculture, talking about our duty to the soil. You can certainly ask if we have the same type of uh, duty to our water. Uh, Ding Darling, some of our legacy uh, of uh, leadership in Iowa helped capture uh, our challenges then, and these cartoons could run uh, as equally uh, today. How many of you have never heard of Ding Darling? Oh, come on. You've heard it. Yeah, how many of you have never heard of Ding Darling? So most everybody has, right? And, I'm, you should, and, and certainly this institution had uh, some connection with him and, and these departments that you're in uh, do. But you'll be amazed at, or I'm amazed at when I talk to audiences, and even of Iowans, you know, and how many of you heard of Ding Darling? And it's like, 
they've never heard of him, which is too bad. Uh, we've all heard of Grant Wood and uh, fertility. Uh, that was a little bit uh, like uh, farming in the old days. This is my dad uh, carrying uh, corn out to the cattle. Uh, we don't farm like my parents. There's Zell uh, out at the pump jack, uh, probably getting ready to pump a bucket of water to come in uh, to the house. Uh, all things change with time. Uh, there's old ham at some point. Uh, we all go through changes. That was when I was the Iowa beef queen. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, farming has changed. Uh, but as I like to say, I hope, you know, the values remain. And part of the values are protecting soil and water. And, of course, how we get there and uh, the path that it may take us to get there sometimes can be tortured and even controversial. And maybe that's where uh, the Waterworks lawsuit uh, comes in. But I'm going to just uh, click through uh, a number of these slides, and I hope that you'll feel free to either, uh, well, not necessarily interrupt, but if you have questions, uh, you can interrupt. But you're all familiar with the lawsuit. And, of course, it uh, is uh, a lawsuit against a set of drainage districts in three counties in Iowa. It's under the Clean Water Act. Uh, it's a uh, citizen uh, lawsuit. Uh, it involves a number of nuanced legal questions, which I'll talk a, a little bit about. Uh, many of which are a first impression, uh, meaning that the courts really haven't had to answer or de de define some of these uh, concepts or deal with these challenges. Uh, I think that it's fair to say the suits, you'd agree that it's controversial, I think. I mean, and being facetious, I think it's really controversial, right? at least with some people, and some people feel that it's unhelpful. Uh, some people even think it's frivolous. It's not frivolous in the legal sense of frivolous, right? Lawyers have a standard in terms of not bringing actions that aren't grounded in the law, and this one is certainly uh, grounded in the law. Uh, whether or not it has merits and win will be determined. That's why we have courts. But I think that the lawsuit has already played and continues to play an important uh, function in our state because we wouldn't be having the type of conversations we're having about water quality, and agriculture's role in it, the role of science, uh, that um, things many of you folks are working in, if we hadn't had this lawsuit. I think it's changed the trajectory uh, of our discussion, and for that, I think we have to uh, at least uh, recognize it. So it's a Clean Water uh, Act suit. It's a citizen suit. It claims that these drainage districts are point sources and need a permit from the EPA under the Clean Water Act. Uh, the drainage districts are at least, you know, according to the lawsuit, uh, managing a series of ditches. Ditches are included as a point source specifically under the Clean Water Act and need a permit. And of course, citizen suit authority is relatively common. Any of you could bring a lawsuit to enforce most of our environmental laws, either at the federal level or even to the state level. And the idea of citizen suit authority was that if the public authorities won't act, citizens can. And then as part of doing that, you have to give notice to the agency and to the individuals that you're bringing the suit for. And a lot of environmental advancement in the United States has been brought through the context of citizen suits. It's really a way of expanding right, the reach of what otherwise would be uh, the attorney general or public legal authorities. And of course, there's usually money involved, right? If you win a citizen suit, you're able to recover your legal fees, which is part of uh, what oftentimes may motivate them. Well, uh, quickly on some of the key legal issues, one of them is that the drainage ditches are an artificial conveyance that's carrying polluted groundwater, uh, and that's what triggers the Clean Water Act uh, application. Uh, as I say there, the parallel may be that they're in some ways similar to a, uh, a sewage uh, treatment system that's collecting uh, what's coming out of uh, your houses and then of course, what's different is there's no treatment system on, uh, at the other end of it. Uh, agriculture is largely exempt from the Clean Water Act. You probably have all uh, heard that. It's uh, exempt uh, in a couple ways, uh, uh, normal farming activities. Uh, also, there's the term uh, exempt non-point sources, including agricultural stormwater runoff. Uh, and so for the most part, uh, Clean Water Act is something that agriculture hasn't had to deal with with the exception of certain types of, and certain sizes and types of livestock <laughs> operations. And even there, the actual rules and the application of the permitting requirements of the Clean Water Act have, are kind of a mixed bag, okay? But another part, and I don't think I have a slide to this effect, 
it's in part important to recognize that the Clean Water Act wasn't necessarily written with agriculture in mind, or maybe other right diffuse sources of pollution. Forestry might be a good example as well. Uh, in fact, what the Clean Water Act was in trying to deal with largely was identifiable point sources of industrial pollution, right? The things that were polluting our, our rivers and streams, outfall pipes coming out of sewage treatment plants, out of factories, right? Boom. And so you have this point source, non-point source distinction. And, you know, it's not fair to say that non-point was kind of a holding pattern, but it was a relatively, you know, understandable way to try to separate different types of pollution. But it wasn't, the term isn't defined in the act, right? And so there's always been uh, some uncertainty, and it's in part further defined by some of the other specific language, like normal <laughs> agricultural practices or agricultural stormwater runoff and irrigation return flows. But the effect of it, it has in part been, we've made a lot of progress on the Clean Water Act. We've cleaned up lots of point sources, applied you know, secondary, tertiary treatment to them. But we haven't necessarily done anything, at least directly under the Clean Water Act to agriculture, in part because it wasn't clear there was any authority to, and certainly there wasn't necessarily any political desire to. And so you don't come away from this thinking that the exception was accidental. No, it was politically intentional, right? I mean, the whole idea was you can have your Clean Water Act and you can deal with all these other things, but don't, right, it's going to be a whole different political lift for Congress to have somehow taken on agriculture specifically, right? Runoff or soil erosion. Uh, though there, you know, there's one other way that agriculture is, in fact, subject to the Clean Water Act, which is the Section 404 dredge and fill permit requirement, which is basically a wetland protection. Isn't necessarily well thought about because in some ways it was supplanted by the swamp, the swamp buster provision of the 85 conservation title, which has some of the same effects. Oops, let's go back to that slide. So the other key, uh, you know, argument here is that the water that's in the, the drainage ditches that's particularly problematic for, in this situation, the Des Moines Water Works, is groundwater. And it got there because it came out of the tile outlets, right, that are being collected in the drainage ditches, okay? And this is a critical nuance to try to make, right, that they have to make, because that's what, in part, gets them out of the agricultural stormwater discharge exemption, right? And I think in very simplistic terms, and I specialize in those, and people I've been visiting with today clearly specialize in much more technical things, right? But, you know, you pour water on top of a table and it runs off, and that looks like surface runoff, right? Uh, if the water seeped down into the table and then came out the sides, well, then the argument would be that isn't surface water runoff, right? That's groundwater, and so that's kind of the parallel with uh, the tile system. And right, the, I just spent a little time with uh, several hydrologists, and it's clear there's not 100% agreement among the hydrological community as to you know where groundwater and surface water stop. But it's an important issue for this lawsuit because it's in part what gets right the water works the jurisdictional bite of the Clean Water Act requirement. And the judge, right, could decide neither of those things work. The drainage ditches really aren't, right, conveyances and the groundwater's not groundwater. And then you have this definite, you know, you have the exemptions for agriculture stormwater runoff. Uh, no real litigation ever deciding this, right? One case from California that involved drainage tile, but the water in it was irrigation return flows, which this water isn't, right? This isn't uh, irrigation. And so, right, a, an issue that's there. Another important thing to recognize is that the lawsuit isn't against individual farmers. It's against the drainage district. It's not against individual tile outlets, right? Though the tile outlets are maybe what are in fact feeding the drainage ditches, but it's the idea that the ditches, right, were an artificially constructed and maintained, right, action. They didn't get there by nature. In fact, we had to put them there, right? That was the whole purpose of amending the Constitution to allow for the creation of drainage districts, giving them eminent domain authority, the ability to assess landowners and to go out and establish this artificial system of drainage, which is important at least, right, if you're trying to fit into the terms of the Clean Water Act, because that appears to what fits in to it being a uh, point source. So, 
extensive body of law in this area, not particularly well understood. Drainage district law is different than kind of typical surface drainage, right? Dominant estate, servient estate, whether or not you can block the water coming off your neighbor, right? This is really more of a, right, the drainage districts are kind of a special purpose form of government created for this limited purpose, right, of doing drainage. Another thing, and I don't know whether I have a slide here, but I'll mention it now. There's another nuance in the case that hasn't necessarily, I think, been well understood. And that is that the press coverage says that the Water Works sued three counties, okay? Well, they didn't sue three counties, right? The lawsuit's not against the counties as counties. The lawsuit's against the Board of Supervisors of those counties serving in their capacity as the trustees for these named drainage districts, right? And you say, okay, well, Professor, that seems like a pretty fine hair you're trying to slice here. But it's an important one from a jurisdictional standpoint, right? Because let's say this is a county, right? And I'm the Board of Supervisors, and you're all citizens of the county, right? And you have taxing authority over all of you, right? But these three folks, they're the people in drainage district number six, right? And so when I'm dealing with them, I'm a Board of Supervisor, but now I'm wearing my drainage district number six trustee hat. And the jurisdiction of my district is really their property. And they're really my citizens for purposes of the functioning of that drainage district. And if you can see where I'm going with this, right, part of the question is, if anybody had to pay to defend them, do you pay for it, right, as residents of the county, which you would if the county was being sued, or instead do we have to take some more narrower, right, view of who's really, right, being defended and represented here. And so, right, Iowa law created this ability for drainage, for the supervisors to serve as the trustees of the districts in part as a convenience because drainage district members can also decide to run their own district, right? And so you have drainage districts of all types. And in fact, uh, Dr. Compton reminded me that you even have ones that are in kind of a no, I was going to say no man's land, but we don't say it in no person's land, right, in the sense that they aren't really formally drainage districts, and they aren't individuals, but instead they're these kind of, right, there's drainage happened, but it's the issue of who might legally uh, be responsible for them. Well, let's go ahead and uh, uh, look at a few more slides. Drainage law, as I said, not well understood, except by you. Now you have a perfect understanding of it. Uh, and uh, you know, another key point, nothing's going to happen very quickly. Uh, and, you know, other than, other than the lawyer spending money maybe, but uh, I, it, it may even be that something happens more quickly and that we may find ways to uh, walk ourselves down off of this wall uh, by, for example, raising the sales tax and actually, uh, you know, taking some type of more assertive action as a state to try to deal with our water quality issues. But nothing's going to happen uh, real quickly. I, I, unless they would get dismissed, right, or thrown out of court. I don't think that's probably going to happen. So the legal maneuvers and delays are likely. Uh, that's certainly underway. Uh, the choice of the drainage districts, I think, was very strategic. Uh, strategic for a couple of reasons. They, uh, they were able to get very, right, accurate water quality readings from publicly accessible sources, validated by another uh, agricultural organization. Uh, they uh, were very agriculturally intensive districts, as I say here, to kind of avoid the goose poop and golf courses defense, right, that it's somebody else. But instead, right, now you have a fairly clarified situation where if it's there, it, it, you know, it's you. That's a different issue than whether or not you're responsible, but, you know, let's not fight over whether or not it's there and where it came from. Implications or possible effects of the ruling are unclear, and unclear for a number of reasons because, uh, there is no permit standard for a drainage district, right? So, I mean, if you went into the EPA or to the state DNR tomorrow and said, I'm a drainage district, I want a permit, what do I have to do, right? What are the affluent standards I have to meet for the quality of water that's in my district? There isn't anything that exists for those, right? And so, in fact, the DNR and the EPA could issue a general permit that may not require you to do much, right? Or it's not clear, right? In fact, 
I think, and of course I've been wrong many times, uh, the drainage districts may in fact be given the opportunity to say, well, what are you going to do? What could you do? You know, how, how are you going to meet the water quality standard? What are you going to do to try to reduce nitrogen leakage or nitrates, right? And so, you know, you know the types of practices, many of which are science in this room uh, worked on. And so what could drainage districts do? Well, you know, uh, some people at this point will say, oh boy, you know, there isn't anything that the drainage districts could actually do, right? If they were required to get a permit, they don't have the authority to tell me as a landowner to do anything. Well, you know, that's another one of those questions. We've never asked it before because we never had to, but I don't think we can assume the answer is nothing, right? Because, but the question is, could the districts have some responsibility for the water that's coming through their system, right? That's the implication uh, or the assumption in requiring to get a permit. But at that point, their argument's going to be, well, where do our legal authorities come from, right? I if the state law that authorizes us only told us we could deal with drainage, you know, can we deal with other things like water quality? So another interesting question. The ability of the districts to act to protect water quality, as they say, is untested. Uh, the, I think the proposed suit was predictable. I mean, the Water Works have been telling people for a couple years that if, if people, you know, if, if more direct action wasn't taken by the state to try to address water quality, that the Water Works was going and was contemplating filing litigation. And they did, right? And then people, oh my God, how could they have done that? Well, they told you they were going to do it two years beforehand, uh, right? And so that's why I think that it was... Uh, uh, predictable and that uh, it grows in part out of a level of frustration on the part of the waterworks uh, and you know the waterworks is a significant entity in the state of Iowa right they have 500,000 people drink water from that system that's a sixth of the population of the state of Iowa right so I mean this isn't a small issue this is a major part of the state's population and of course in many ways the lawsuit really revolves around the questions of accountability and responsibility, right? And whether anybody else upstream is going to uh, perhaps accept either of those. I'm speaking now as the water works, right? Don't attribute that to me personally. Okay, and so why did they decide to sue? For a number of reasons. I think the governor's veto in May of the supplemental appropriation uh, was probably a, a tipping point uh, that led them to believe that, you know, these people really aren't serious, right? I mean, the legislature appropriated an additional $14 million, right? It went through a relatively heavy lift legislatively. The state has plenty of funding, and then it was vetoed. And so, okay, I'm not quite sure how we square that with that we're doing everything we can. And so they filed suit. As I say, the suit's about accountability. And there are several ironies uh, in the, the lawsuit. <laughs> I, one of the ironies is, you have the soil and water conservation districts that were created for the purposes of dealing with soil and water issues. They're not in the lawsuit, right? And it's not clear whether they would have been a better target, right? Part of the issue there is whether or not you could somehow say that the districts, because of a failure to enforce the soil loss limits, somehow contributed to these water quality issues, right? But it's a fairly attenuated legal argument that you'd have to make. And then the irony is, of course, you have the drainage districts who are being sued, and it's not clear they have any direct authority uh, over water quality. Uh, the irony between the difference between surface water and groundwater, and the kind of the counterintuitive idea that when it rains, the water quality, in fact, right, the contamination goes down because you have a dilution, and then it's later when the tile lines start pumping that the waters go up. And right there, I say fourth here, I think uh, one of the other ironies is we've had this, I think, serious and unfortunate anti-regulatory dogma that's driven uh, much of uh, the agricultural group positions for decades. And it's understandable, but at the same time, it probably prevented us from actually thinking about it and developing regulatory type tools that might have helped us avoid some of the problems. But, so the reactions are mixed. Certainly, uh, you know, people have said, oh my gosh, you know, the 
Des Moines declared war on rural Iowa, and we had a boycott Iowa. And uh, this summer, the governor said, you know, the waterworks needs to tone down its language if it wants public <coughs> assistance to deal with this. But it's not clear where that public assistance is going to come from. The Iowa poll, which was taken last spring, showed, I think, a, a, a surprising level of public support, even in, in rural areas, uh, for the litigation. And it, you don't think you can read that, that it's for the litigation because, yeah, I really think that this section of the Clean Water Act needs to be interpreted this way, right? The support is for the idea that we need to have a more uh, perhaps responsible dis discussion about water quality, right? And that the lawsuit may, in fact, in part be a vehicle uh, to do that. Uh, I mentioned uh, the inadequacy of the nutrient reduction strategy, and I do that. Uh, cautiously, right? I mean, uh, as I've said, the nutrient reduction strategy is long on science, and it's, you know, the science is strong. A lot of you folks in the room developed it. I think that it's somewhat asymmetrical if you look at the policy components of it, right? Because there isn't a similarly developed idea as to how we're actually going to, right, implement these things. And you folks, right, you know, love talk about, you know, science and technologies. I'm a lawyer, obviously now by training, but we also have technologies of justice, right? I mean, the way we do things, the way we use laws to achieve, right, certain objectives. And if your starting point is that there's no role for any type of regulatory system to help do this, well, then you both have disarmed yourself and you've probably, right, I think, promise to either make your efforts ineffectual or longer than they need to. And, um, you know, I think then part of the question becomes money and a real question on the money. And, uh, you know, I've, for full disclosure purposes, I've been on the board of the Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation for 20 plus years. Uh, we were one of the major organizations supporting the I Will campaign, the Water, Land, and Legacy. This is the natural resource right to vote. Those of you who were in Iowa in 2010 know you had an opportunity to pass a constitutional amendment. 61% of the voters said yes. The Constitution says the next time the sales tax is increased, the first three-eighths of a cent goes to fund a protected natural resource protection fund. The formula is established in legislation. And, right, this issue is still there. The legislature hasn't enacted it. Uh, they didn't this session. There was a bill introduced. It's going to generate a chunky amount of money, probably in the $150 million a year plus range, over half of which is dedicated to water quality and soil conservation. It would provide the type of funding that even the nutrient reduction strategy says is probably going to be necessary, right, to help implement these practices. So that's an idea, right? So if you think there's nothing we can do. A regulatory reality check, I'll skip through this you know, quickly, but you hear lots of people yakking about how uh, uh, one size regulation, <laughs> and one size regulations, you know, they don't fit anybody. Well, you know, part of the reality how regulations work is they're one size regulations, right? I mean, that's where we start. And if you don't think so, as I say in here, right, uh, or wherever I said it, uh, you know, go get drunk and drive down the road and when the officer stops you and you blow a 1.2, tell him, well, you know, officer, that .08 shouldn't apply to me because I can really handle my liquor, right? And their point was, no, 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 the rule of 0.8, that applies to everybody, right? I mean, it, it's established a societal marker and an expectation of conduct, right? You don't drive 50 in a school zone and say, I'm a really careful driver, right? Regulations, right, and so a regulation as it relates to something like water quality, just like we have for soil conservation, could say you have a responsibility to not pollute the water of the state. The Groundwater Protection Act says that, right? It doesn't necessarily say how you have to get there or what you have to do, but if you don't have anything that establishes some type of responsibility, then, right, you're always pushing, right, a ball in this sense, well, I can't afford it, you can't make me do it, I don't have to do it, right? And so we have to think about the role of regulations in society, at least I think so. And if you don't think regulations are important, all of you who understand soil conservation, and we'll segue to our conservation conference, right? We've had conservation for a long time, right? SCS has been around, we've been doing it since the 1930s. It wasn't until the 85 conservation title 
right, which was in the lens of history maybe the most important soil <coughs> conservation law we have, that said rather than just asking how are you farming the land you set aside, we asked how are you farming the rest of your ground, right? And that's where the concept of highly erodible land came out. That's where the idea of having conservation plans on highly erodible land, you had five years to d adopt one, right, or develop one, another five years to implement one, and now you, every year you sign an AD 1026 that certifies, if I have highly erodible land, I'm meeting a conservation plan, and I haven't drained any swamps, swamp buster, and I haven't plowed up any new, right, sod, sod buster, unless I did it according to a conservation plan. And then we also had the CRP and a number of other programs. And our soil loss levels dropped dramatically, right, after the early 80s, partly because we pulled land out with the CRP, but we also articulated a responsibility to soil erosion. Voluntary, voluntary because participation in federal farm programs is voluntary. If you want to ride bareback and you don't want to have crop protection, you don't want to have uh, right, uh, you know, crop insurance or other thing, you don't have to be in the farm programs and you don't have to meet right, any of those soil limits with the exception that Iowa law requires that every landowner has a duty to meet the county soil water conservation district commissioner's soil loss limits, 161A43, upheld by the Iowa Supreme Court. And as I say here, and this of course is my opinion, Iowa water won't be clean until we require some type of individual responsibility on the part of people to at least think about what they're doing. And the point is, most people already are. You don't refrain from getting, right, drunk and driving because there's a rule on the books. You do it because you embrace that as part of a social compact and a responsibility, right? And lots of farmers do too in terms of taking care of the soil and water, right? And an exercise in which we more, I think, formally and, right, publicly articulated it, what it meant, and then helped people be able to do it isn't something that we should necessarily fear, unless your fear is that it somehow is going to cramp your autonomy or cramp your ability to, what, pollute the water and destroy the soil, right? Well, of course, nobody wants to do that, right? So, two rules I would could adopt, I'll just throw these out, the whole idea of vegetative buffers, which I've, right, been informed and reminded of again today, that don't do anything necessarily to pull out nitrates, unless maybe we, uh, or nitrates, unless we made them uh, saturated, we could also have, right, fertilizer, uh, we could have a nutrient management plan requirement. Ohio adopted this in the last year. Minnesota has a buffer strip requirement. Uh, there's the Iowa law uh, about uh, soil conservation upheld by the Iowa Supreme Court in the Woodbury County Ortner case. Uh, the court said, uh, of course, uh, the state has, uh, uh, has the ability to require people to uh, protect their soil. Uh, because it's a vital resource and the state has a right to do it. Uh, there are certainly risk and uncertainty with the lawsuit, uh, right, in terms of what might uh, happen next. And, you know, a couple of things just quickly, too. Uh, I said I'd give you a little bit of an update. I think I've got uh, ten new things about uh, uh, the lawsuit. And the ten new things are things that you may well be uh, aware of. The lawsuit was filed. Uh, the legislature didn't enact a sales tax increase, at least this time. Uh, a new group was file, formed in May, which has been running fairly aggressive uh, information commercials about the litigation. Uh, they're in the news uh, again today in today's paper. Uh, the business leaders of Des Moines have become a little bit more concerned about the litigation, what it may be doing, and uh, the chamber and others have formed a water advisory committee. A number of people in the room are on it. Uh, I had the pleasure of being uh, invited to participate in it. Um, there's been a fair amount of, I think, misinformation about the lawsuit, uh, some unintentional, perhaps some intentional, uh, but that's maybe to be understood. Uh, the insurance company or the insurance pool that represents the counties uh, refused to cover the three counties. Uh, and so that's part of why they have gone out and are looking for other sources of money. And this uh, uh, agricultural uh, legal defense fund was created by a number of agricultural organizations that has raised some number, probably in the low uh, seven figures, uh, to uh, defend uh, the lawsuit. And at least some of the materials from the organizations supporting that say that the donations are 
confidential and also fully tax deductible. Uh, and so it's an interesting process whereby the funds may be coming from to uh, defend it. And the case is before Judge Bennett. And I've known Judge Bennett for 35 years. And he's a, a brilliant judge and in some ways unpredictable. Uh, unpredictable in that, uh, yeah, well, he's unpredictable, right? But I, I think the point of it is, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but I mean it's... Uh, He'll follow this issue wherever he thinks it needs to go, right? And he wouldn't be afraid of issuing an opinion that people would say, well, geez, nobody in the United States ever said that before. Uh, not that he would do that, but the point is he's not afraid to uh, challenge conventional wisdom or be reversed on appeal. So with that, uh, let me talk just a freckle more, and I'll enlist my friend Tyler. Maybe if you're going to hand them out, that way you can start the back this time. But uh, we've got uh, this uh, conference that we've got coming up in uh, uh, two weeks called uh, Sustaining Our Iowa Land. And uh, we've pulled together, and I hope you might visit the website. It's at the Agricultural Law Center. You can get to it uh, by looking at Drake, Ag Law. Or, and it's, a, I think, a wonderful set of, of speakers from farm leaders like... Uh, uh, Ray Gasser and uh, Wayne Friedrichs and the Soybean Association. Tim Smith, who's been in the news, was just recognized by the White House. Bob Lynch, uh, head of the Conservation District. Uh, a number of your colleagues, uh, Rick Cruz, J. Arbuckle, uh, Mike Duffy. Uh, a number of conservation organization leaders, uh, Jim Gulliford, so on water conservation, Claire Lindahl from the Conservation Districts. Jason Weller, the chief of the NRCS, is going to come out and speak. Uh, Patty Benicky, and some of you may remember Dr. Benicky, right? His daughter Patty is the uh, uh, North American representative on the UN Environmental Program, uh, and uh, she's going to be a luncheon speaker on uh, uh, Friday to talk about the International Year of Soil. And so the little piece that I'm handing out now, which some of you are going to get, and I'll just uh, uh, mention it, and, and uh, uh, I'll think about how we might be able to make it available to you if there's some way that your uh, audience is captured. In pulling together this conference, uh, you know, m my view is that these are important subjects and we ought to be willing to talk about them candidly. And uh, one of the people I was visiting with said, well, we ought to be able to make this more controversial, right? And not necessarily controversial in let's poke a stick into somebody, right? But controversial in that, well, let's instead of it just having happy talk about how everything's great and getting better, uh, that we actually, you know, ask some questions. And so we developed a, a set of questions. And this summer with the Leopold Center funding, we had a series of focus groups that uh, we did, uh, one in Centerville and one in Ankeny and one in Iowa City and one with the NRCS staff where we refined these questions. And so we put together now this 20 questions about soil and water conservation policy. You know, non-provocative questions like uh, is uh, our attention to feeding the world diverting our attention from sound soil conservation uh, or uh, should every farmer in the state uh, be required uh, or every landowner be required to have a conservation plan a lot of people think they do right oh, but there's nothing in Iowa law or federal law that requires you to have a conservation plan uh, unless you have highly erodible land and uh, is the availability of subsidized crop insurance uh, leading us to farm ground, uh, farm more erosive ground and take more risk. So there are those type of questions. And for the conference, if you attend, and I'd encourage you to at least consider it, we're going to send this questionnaire out to everybody in advance, get their responses so that we have this kind of baseline of people's views on these issues. And then the last question to ask you for your one big idea. I mean, if you could change one thing about how we deal with soil and water conservation policy in the state, what would it be? And we'll try to distill those answers and then use those as a, a device to help sh uh, guide some of the conversation. And so that's what we're trying to do on uh, the November 19th and, and 20th. Uh, and we're going to give some awards to people at a banquet on the 19th for being stewards of Iowa land. And, oh, boy, it's going to be fun. So anyway.